So what's been happening so far, folks, we see here that um, Moses and Aaron are now and have been uh, instructed by God. They've been instructed by God to go to to go to Pharaoh. And they've been, been instructed for one specific thing, which is to have free the children of Israel, haven't they? To free them from from Egypt. Um, to go in the beginning, it tells us to go there, you know, three days uh, so that they can worship and offer sacrifices unto the Lord. And then also at the latter part of chapter six, we got into the the genealogy and so forth of of uh, the Levites, which was really important. But now what we see here is we're going to be entering into um, the beginning of some of those neat plagues that God is going to dish out amongst Pharaoh and those Egyptians. And uh, so and there's some things I want you to, to, to kind of pay attention here on. I know it's Wednesday night. I know you guys have your coffee and you're kind of settled in. But there is some important stuff here that we want to glean from. And uh, anytime you come to something that is being fully repeated, repeated, just so repetitive. You got to think it's there for a reason. God is saying this for a reason that we're to pay attention. And so it says, so one of the things that I found very cool is that from chapter seven, all the way back to chapter 13, to where they're finally let go and out of Egypt, you're going to see a a statement that I believe is very important for us tonight. Uh, It says, and that's Beginning chapter seven, verse one, it says, so the Lord said to Moses. And you know what? I see this here and I think, man, Lord, you have you are giving instructions to Moses for these chap for these through these particular chapters and in their life. And we're seeing here that the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses, the Lord said to Moses. And so that's very important that we just kind of bring that up to the surface and not let it kind of sit at the bottom. And we already know that God is going to be the one doing everything that all Moses has to do is show up and take instruction. It's really all he's got to do. And you know what? There are many times I know in our lives that the Lord said to Tom, Or the Lord said to Patrick or to Lana. I mean, you know, it's like the Lord said. But what we see here many times, uh, I'm sure you guys, but me, I like don't do what the Lord says. And it's not right. We've got to do what God says. And so as God gives us instructions and gives us these marching orders, we've got to be in tune to listen to him and then to go. So we see here in verse in chapter seven, verse one, it begins by saying, so the Lord said to Moses, see, I have made you as God to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother shall be your prophet. Verse two, you shall speak all things that I command you and Aaron, your brother shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of this, out of his land. Two things here we see immediately in these first uh, two portions of Scripture. But before we get into that, let's offer a word of prayer to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for this time of study, this great time of Bible study, Lord, that we can get into your word, that, Lord, that we can pull from it, extract from it, God, and just desire to hear and to glean the thing so that we can be equipped, Lord, and may it be applicable in our lives, Lord. And so with that, Lord, we just thank you for your faithfulness of your word, your faithfulness of the example of your servants. And Lord, uh, may we just be drawn closer to you as a result of tonight's study. So Lord, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what do we have happening here in verses 1 and 2? Right off the top, like I pointed out, we see that the Lord is saying something to Moses. And he's very explicit here and very direct. He says, I have made you as God to Pharaoh. Hmm. What's he talking about? Is he saying that he's going to make Moses a God? He says here, I'm making you as God to Pharaoh. Well, he's not saying anything like he's making him a God of any any sort. But what he means by that is that as he's made him as God, he is now making him an instrument, an instrument of God. And know this, that as you and I go, and even as the youth this Friday night, they go out and they minister 
uh, and, and evangelize there in Colonial Williamsburg, the love of Jesus and the gospel, they are as God, not in the sense of they are God, and don't get me wrong there, but they are being used as instruments of God. And it's important that we understand that. That is, God has made us and created us in his likeness, as it tells us in the word. Hey, we are as him in the way that we go out and tell people. We talk to people. We minister to people just the same way God does. And so that's really cool. So that's what he means here when he says, I have made you as God to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother, shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I have commanded you. And Aaron, your brother, shall tell Pharaoh to send the children of Israel out of his land. Interesting. The goal here, of course, is to get them out of Pharaoh's land forever. Not just for a time, not just for a season, but forever. That's the idea for good. Going on now in verse 3, it says, And I will harden... Note that word, I will. God is saying, he's still speaking to Moses here. I will harden Pharaoh's heart and multiply my signs and my wonders in the land of Egypt. Verse four, but Pharaoh will not heed you so that I may lay my hand on Egypt and bring my armies and my people, the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt by great judgments. And the Egyptians shall know that I am Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the children of Israel from among them. Then Moses and Aaron did so just as the Lord commanded them. So they did. Verse seven. And Moses was 80 years old and Aaron 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron saying, we'll stop right there. Kind of a cliffhanger. Okay, this is what's happening. What's happening in these portions of scriptures is, you know, at this point, uh, God is going to be showing his stuff, and basically. He's going to be showing his stuff, and he says, you know what? Um, and he says, uh, as he goes through here, he says, he's giving uh, Moses these particular uh, commandments, and he's saying, you know, Moses and Aaron, what I like about them is they've done as unto the Lord. It tells us there that they did. And so as we go further, we see here the ages of these two guys as well. We see that Moses was 80 years old in verse 7, and Aaron was 83 in, in the same verse. You know, that's something that um, I just have to think about myself personally. Personally, this kind of uh, spoke to me because, you know what, I wasn't 20 years old starting out in the ministry. You know, it wasn't until... Uh, going out, you know, being in the ministry is one thing in your church and coming alongside your pastor, but still being there in your hometown and working and whatnot, but actually being sent out to start, you know, pastoring a church. I mean, you guys know it's only been a couple of years. So, uh, gee, I'm 47 now, so that makes me 45, huh? You know, I was no spring chicken. I am no spring chicken. But you know what? We see here that at 80 years old, we see God using Moses. We see at 83, we see him using his brother Aaron. And so you know what? Um, God never accepts that excuse of old age. He never does. He never accepts that lame excuse like, Lord, I'm just too old to do this. Lord, I don't have enough experience to do this. Lord, I'm not equipped to do this. God doesn't accept that. We see here it's evidence in Scripture that at 80 years of age and 83, these guys can serve him. They can serve him. So be encouraged, whatever age we are, that you know what? God has a plan, and that's what's exciting to know. And so we see here as we continue on in verse 9, when Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, show a miracle for yourselves, then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it before Pharaoh and let it become a serpent. Well, here's what, what I meant by that God is, is at this point saying, okay, fine. When Pharaoh speaks to you, show a miracle yourselves. Then you shall say to Aaron, take your rod and cast it down. So he's basically saying, okay, fine. Show, show me your stuff, Pharaoh. Show me the goods that you have. Show me the best that you have got. And then he goes on now in verse 10. 
And he says, so Moses and Aaron went into Pharaoh and they did so just as the Lord commanded. And we'll stop there again. You know, I, I continue to be amazed on how I am like so not like these two guys. You know, when God many times gives me my marching orders or what I'm asked to do, I am like beginning off pretty good, you know? We all kind of do this maybe. We begin a little, we begin right where the Lord wants us. But then we start kind of saying, well, how about if I do it this way? How about if I do it that way? How about if I add this here, Lord, to your plan? How about if I take this away? Because I think, Lord, I know more about this person than you do. So I'm going to do this and minister to them that way. So, you know, I like this because it says they did so just as the Lord commanded. That's important to note because when the Lord speaks to us, we must do as the Lord commands. You know, it's so funny that we think as children of God that we have a choice. I mean, we do. Okay, sovereign will of man. I'm not getting into that whole thing. But we have a choice. But you know what? This is our creator, gang. This is the guy who has made everything that we see, touch, smell, witness around this world. He's made it all. And we say, no. Or we say, not your way, but mine. But you know what? God is graceful, isn't he? God is merciful into where he will let us and he'll give us enough rope, enough lead line. And then, boom, we go, okay, Lord, now we need your help. And he says, okay, it's about time. Come on back. So you know what? We see this here, and it's like, I love this, is that Moses and Aaron are doing explicitly the direction of God. And it says in that verse 10, and Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh, remember, just as the Lord commanded, and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Verse 11, but Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So the magicians of Egypt, they also did in like manner with their enchantments. Ooh, enchantments. Interesting, huh? As we see here in verse 10 and 11, what's happening? Well, they go into Pharaoh just as the Lord commanded. Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants, and it became a serpent. Reminiscent of what happened when the burning bush experience with Moses, right? Um, he threw the, his staff down, and boom, it turned into a servant, serpent. He asked him to pick it up, and it turned back into the rod. So we see here then that Pharaoh does something. He goes, fine, I'll up one up you, and I'll one up your God. He goes, he calls his wise men and his sorcerers, and they also did in manner with their enchantments. I mean, who are these guys in league with? Satan, right? They're in league with the devil. There is these miracles that are given by God. But understand, the devil can do miracles too, folks. The devil is just as miraculous in his things that he does as the Lord and we've got to make sure that we know which is of the devil, which is of the Lord. We've got to be discerning, folks. We've got to be discerning there. And so we see here, Pharaoh doesn't even blink. Isn't that incredible? When this stuff happens, he's like, fine, nice trick. Look what my guys can do. He doesn't even blink. He calls for his cabinet, his guys. And they did the same thing in like manner. And like I said, these folks are tapped into some serious demonic power through the enchantments. And they were sorcerers and stuff. I mean, we're not talking about that old TV show, Bewitched. You know what I mean? It's not like that. This is the real thing. These guys are tapped into Satan. But you know what? These guys also, as is Pharaoh, these guys are opposing God and his representatives. Do you see that? By what they're doing, and what Sarah and, and Pharaoh will continue to do, I was thinking sorcerer and Pharaoh, what Pharaoh will continue to do is a harden his heart, and what he's doing is he is in opposition to God, direct opposition to the Lord and his representatives being Moses and Aaron. In fact, the whole nation of Egypt is all into this. My goodness, if their leaders are this way, the people are the same. They're no different. And like I said, 
miracles we have to watch out. In fact, Moses said that if, if there's a miracle that takes you away from God, it's not of God. We have to be careful to discern that. In verse 12, it goes on to say, For every man threw down his rod, and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Kind of cool here. His snake ate up their snakes. They walked out of the room with no rods, huh? No snakes, you know? So they walk out of the room that way, and they ate up all the snakes of the others. And I'm thinking, that must have been kind of gross, huh? It's like you see all this stuff happening, this one snake eating up all these other snakes. Quite a sight to see, I would think. But we see here that God is the one. Uh, his snake is the one, and, and his staff is much greater than any of the others. And we have to see that and know that. That the, that the lesser being that of the sorcerers and the, the divinators, that's the lesser being eaten up by the greater. And that's God. That's the Holy One. So the message is really obvious to Pharaoh right now. And, and it's a beginning of what we're going to see to where Pharaoh is finally going to realize that he is messing with the greatest God of the universe. He's messing with the Lord, God, Yahweh. That's who he's messing with. So now in verse 13, And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them, as the Lord had said. You know, remember reading earlier last week, we talked and referred back to the Lord told Moses, he told him that he was not going to take heed to, to what he was going to be doing. He was going to have a hardened heart. He wasn't going to do as what was expected. And so we see here, just as the Lord had said. And you know what? I, again, I think about it in my own life, guys. I think about it as like when God says something, it's going to turn out this way. You better watch out. It's going to end up this way. You know, don't go down that path. It's always as the Lord had said. And I don't know about you guys, but that's convicting to me. Because I wonder how many times does the Lord have to tell me something before I finally say, okay, God, I hear you loud and clear. I understand what you're, what you're saying to me. Before I go a little further in the scripture, I want to introduce you as we get an introduction to some of the plagues, the 10 plagues that are going on. Know this, that the plagues, they're not just some haphazard plague that God is desiring to, well, I think I'll just throw some frogs or I think I'll throw some lice or I think I'll cause some boils, you know. He's not just haphazardly doing these things. It's, it's for a purpose. These are, these are miracles of judgments that he's laying upon Egypt. And they're to show Pharaoh, not just to show him, but they're to deliberately show Pharaoh God's purpose. God has a purpose in what he's doing here, folks. He has a purpose. And I'm going to state you three purposes that God is doing through these miracles of the plagues. The first one is very obvious. He wants to get his people out of Egypt. So his people wants to get them out of Egypt. Pretty easy. And so when you think about the Jews, you think about salvation, you think about them exiting, getting out of Exodus, you know, that's pretty much what it means. Exodus, the Exodus, the exiting. You think about them and their salvation. But you know what? It's not just about them. And this is something that I, I want you to hear. It's, it's not just about the children of Israel and their, their trek to get into the promised land. It just doesn't stop there. And you know what? It never stops with what we think, you know, we, we, we see one dimensionally, really, when it comes to spiritual things. We, do, we don't have every facet like God has. And so we, we just aren't that spiritual to see so many facets that God has around us. So the obvious thing is that he's taking his children out of Israel to get them out of, um, out of Egypt into the land of Canaan. Because he wants to continue on with his people, the, the redemptive line and so forth. But know this, know this. It's about, fully about God's redemption. It's about his, his redemption. And it's not just for the children of Israel. But it goes beyond that. It's for the whole world. If they did not get out of Egypt, 
where would it where would we be if they did not get out of egypt God would not have had that opportunity to take them into the rest, take them into the land of Canaan, continue on with a redemptive line, giving us Jesus Christ. See, we, when, we, when we read the scriptures and we see what God is doing, many times the obvious is so the obvious, but there's some other things that God is trying to show us. God is salvation. God is redemption. God is love. And what he does is he's saying, you know, I'm pulling my children out, but it's not just for them. It's for the entire world. And I think that's so cool. God is thinking way down the line. And he's thinking on a way larger scale than we can ever imagine. So that's the first part. He wants to get his children out of Egypt. But most importantly, it's God's plan of redemption and the fact it's for the entire world. The second point, um, and that's if you go back to um, 7.4, even I'll cite the scripture on there, 7.4. Um, judging for the oppression of the Jews. Uh, the first one was also 7.4, I believe. But this one also is in 7.4. Uh, judging the oppression of the Jews. You know, that's what God is doing. With these different judgments, these miracle of judgments, he's judging this oppression. He wants to get them out. Because God brought them into the land of Egypt for a specific reason. And we learned about that, right? We learned about that with, with Joseph and his family, bringing them in, kind of bringing them in a cocoon and, and protecting them so that it'll go from a family of 70-something people to a whole nation of 2 to 3 million. They weren't a nation when they came into Egypt. But now they are a nation. God protected them. Still work needed to be done in Canaan with, with the different um, uh, other tribes out there. It's God's timing now. Time for them to come out. But he brought them into Egypt, or, or he brought them into Egypt really for a specific reason. That's for that cocooning. That's for that um, protection. Not to be worked to death and not to be enslaved. That's not why he put them in Egypt. So that's the second point. The third point is that these plagues that we're going to be reading into in the coming weeks is going to show that God is above all other gods. Remember, he introduced himself now as Yahweh. Yahweh. So God is communicating this to his people. And, you know, and with this, you know, about the worshiping of, of other things and so forth as he puts uh, makes the Nile turn red, one of those miracles. And, you know, how the Nile was just such a worshiping uh, type of, of they worship the Nile, plain and simple, as a god. And so he also didn't want his people to start doing this. He didn't want his people to get involved in this idol worship. In fact, um, in Exodus 12, 12, if you turn there with me, Quickly to Exodus 12, 12. He says, for I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and I will strike all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast and against all gods of Egypt. OK, all gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Why? I am the Lord. That's cool. So here we know that he doesn't want any of this idol worship going on. Also, if we turn into Numbers uh, chapter 33, turn to Numbers over to the right. Chapter 33, verse 4. Chapter 33, verse 4 of Numbers, it says, For the Egyptians were burying all their firstborn, whom the Lord had killed among them, also their gods, the Lord had executed judgments. So we saw the beginning part. Now we see the ending part. They are, he's executed his judgments on all the gods of Egypt. Praise the Lord. Why? He says, I am the Lord. And so we see here that the whole nation of Egypt, you know, was just steeped in idolatry and idol worship and so forth. So God gives them strong medicine to deal with it. You know, he's giving them everything he's got. So here they're worshiping all of these false gods. And and what we see here is that there's a culture that's been created that that, you know, that it was OK to do that. That's what they were doing in Egypt. But you know what? There there's no excuse for anyone, any of us 
to be involved in idol worship, things that aren't of the Lord, you know, and and and, and we can get caught up in things that the world throws at us. You know, uh, it can be anything. Really, an idol is something that you just place above the Lord. That's really all it is. So whatever that thing is that you're placing above the God or that one thing. I heard Greg Laurie talk to, uh, teach on this, and he said, you know, an idol is something that you think of the first thing you think of in the morning and the last thing you think of when you go to bed at night. Because that's priority. That's the first thing you're thinking about in the morning, the last thing you're thinking about at night. Chances are that's an idol in your life. And so we have to be careful of those things. And uh, there's no excuse for any of us to, to worship anything. And what, what's happening here is they're worshiping like the Nile, things that are the creation. They're not worshiping the creator. We end up many times worshiping things that have the created things, but not the creator or the designer. The design of things we end up worshiping, but not the designer. And that is the Lord. In fact, turn with me into the New Testament to Romans. In the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. Say, Jesus, when you're there. All right. Romans, chapter 1, verses 18 to 25, it says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to them. Again, talk about the creator, the designer. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts and in their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man and birds and four-footed animals and creeping things. Verse 24. Therefore, God also gave them up to uncleanliness, uncleanness in the lusts of their hearts to dishonor their bodies among themselves who exchanged the truth of God for the lie and worshiped and served the creator rather than the, the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. You see, God tells us, don't worship what's created. We need to be worshiping the creator. Don't worship the design. Worship the designer. And that is the Lord. And it tells us here what God has done. He gave them up, as it tells us in verse 26, you know. And so we see here. In fact, there's a teaching by Chuck Smith about, you know, I mean, you go to Israel today. They have done the excavations, you know. You go down to these different times, as far as they can tell, uh, based on their digs, about what time uh, they were talking about, what year they were at. And you can see as different times as Israel was burned and this, you see these charred markings and you see all these layers. And then they're digging up these little idols, these little false idols, you know the Ashtoreth and so forth. They're, they're pulling up all these different things. And, and that's really what the Bible calls pornea. That, that's that pornography of that day. Those are those idols made in the image of man. They make an image of man with ears that can't hear, with mouths that can't speak, with eyes that can't see. See, they had nothing else to go by except themselves. So they fashioned a, an image after themselves. How useless is that, huh? That is so useless and lame because it's nothing but a piece of wood, just good to chuck into the fire. That's really all it's good for. And so we see here that this is, again, what was going on. This is what the Lord wanted to remove them from because Egypt was fully, fully in, immersed in that. Go back to Exodus with me. 
So we see now, and you guys have a scripture now, you've got quite a few, regarding the, uh, the, the worshiping of idols, uh, worshiping the, cre- the creature versus the creator. And so, you know, um, when you look at creation, you know, understand, when you look at creation, it speaks of what? A creator, doesn't it? It speaks of a creator. When, when you look at a design, it speaks of a designer. And that's important that we keep that in perspective. The creator is always going to be greater than the creation. Always. The designer is always greater than the design. That's important. Turn with me also to the book of Psalms, okay? Psalm chapter 19. Say, Jesus, when you are there. Wow, you guys are quick, quicker than me. Psalm 19, verses 1 through 6. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto night utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth and their words to the end of the world. In them he has set a tabernacle for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Verse 6. Its rising is from one end of the heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from the heat. So we see here, even in this psalm, talking about the declaring of God, what his firmament, what his handiwork shows, the creation. We're not to worship that, but we're to worship the creator. He who has set a tabernacle for the sun. You guys know what that means? Setting a tabernacle for the sun. He set that place for the sun. He's the one who's positioned it so perfectly within however many feet or inches from the earth so that we don't get fried, so that we don't freeze. It's God who has hung that up there perfectly. That's, we go, wow, that's a recognition of who God is and his power. We don't worship the sun. And for what it does, we worship who created the sun. You see, that's what we have to be doing. So we see here that, All over the world, we see these different designs and so forth. And people, unfortunately, are worshiping the designs versus the designer. And you know what? The reason why, and I was thinking about this and going, you know, why is it that that people do this? Why do they worship the design versus designer? Well, one of the reasons that I could think of as I was just meditating on this, the Lord gave me, was that it's like a disobedience, deliberate disobedience. Because the idolater, the one worshiping that particular idol, is just saying that they only want to worship it, but with no accountability. There's no accountability in worshiping something that can never speak to you. Worshiping something that could never encourage you. Worshiping something that could never build you up. Worshiping something that could never convict you. You see, there's, there's no accountability with that. So sure, I want to worship this music stand. I can worship the music stand, and it's never going to do anything back for me. I have no accountability now. But when I start worshiping the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I start worshiping Jehovah and Yahweh, then I've got conviction in my life. And then because I've got conviction, I've got transformation. I've got change. That's what happens in my life. So, here we go. They make it a God, and they worship it. That's what they do. But know this, guys, that God loves us. God loves us. And many times, even by circumstances, God will show the foolishness of us worshiping things above him. He'll show us that quite, quite clearly at times. So we see here that the only alternative God has in judging Egypt for its idolatry for the short term, for the short term, is to step in and show them who the real God is. The Lord goes to town with these people. And know that these judgments, too, just as a side note, weren't done in just a period of days, but based on the times and the time of year and so forth, and as we get further on in Scripture, we'll see the months and so forth as they do Passover. Um, It's probably, the commentators say, a period of like maybe eight months or so. And so over this time, 
they're going through this and they're witnessing these miracles by the Lord. So verses 14 through 21. So the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hard and he refuses to let the people go. God, or I'm sorry, go to Pharaoh in the morning when he goes out to the water and you shall stand by the river's bank to meet him. And the rod which was turned to a serpent you shall take in your hand and you shall say to him, the Lord God of Hebrews of the Hebrews has sent me to you saying, let my people go. You guys are going to get used to that quite a bit. Let my people go. It's going to be over and over again. Let my people go. Um, lost my place. Here we go. That they may serve me in the wilderness, but indeed until now you would not hear. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Now, chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. Turn there quickly with me. Chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. This is pretty cool because God is being specific here. He says in, in Exodus uh, 17, he says, by this, you shall know that I am Lord. In chapter five, verse one and two, afterward, Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, thus says the Lord God of Israel, let my people go that they may hold a feast to me in the wilderness. Okay. And Pharaoh said, who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, nor will I let Israel go. Well, turn back to verse 17 of chapter seven. Thus says the Lord, by this you shall know that I am the Lord. Man, God keeps his promises. He's making a bold introduction to him here. Behold, I will strike the waters which are in the river with a rod that is in my hand, and they shall be turned to blood. And the fish that are in the river shall die, and the river shall stink. Stinketh, I think it says in the New King James. And the Egyptians will loathe to drink the water of the river. Verse 19, then the Lord spoke to Moses, say to Aaron, take your rod and the stretch out your hand over the waters of Egypt, over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds and over all the pools of water that they may become blood. And there shall be blood throughout all the land of Egypt, both in buckets of wood and pitchers of stone. And Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded. So he lifted up the rod and struck the waters that were in the river, in the sight of Pharaoh, in the sight of his servants, and all the waters that were in the river were turned to blood. Wow. Turned to blood. One more verse. The fish that were in the river died, and the river stank. And the Egyptians could not drink the water of the river, so there was blood throughout all the land of Egypt. Wow. What do we see happening here? Well, pretty obvious, huh? It's kind of obvious what's happening. Giving them instructions. Put your rod in, in the water. Make them see that this, this Nile, that of which they, they, they worship, is really owned by me, he says. It's my creation, he says. And he says, I'm going to turn this body of water and other bodies of water in buckets and so forth into blood. Can you imagine that? Just seeing everything turn into blood. You know, it's interesting. This God, the River Nile, it can't even defend itself against the mighty Lord. It can't defend itself against and so-called God to the Egyptians See, God is specifically, like I said, purposely attacking these areas. These, and we'll find out as we get to the frogs in chapter 8, uh, the frog god that they worshipped. Kind of interesting. So, this is also reminiscent. You guys remember the firstborn that they said of the Jews, throw them into the River Nile, right? Can you imagine them when they were doing that? All the blood of the River Nile. But now God is saying, man, look, I'm going to destroy this water. I'm going to do it with my hand. And so we go on further. Then the magicians of Egypt did so with their enchantments. Again, we have this demonic enchantments. And Pharaoh's heart grew hard, and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. And Pharaoh turned and went into his house, neither with his heart moved by this. So all the Egyptians dug all around the river for water to drink, because they could not drink the water of the river. And seven days passed after the Lord had struck the river. Interesting. You know, this Nile was a source of life for the Egyptians. Being there in the, in the desert, that's where all life sprang from. And now they're desperate, digging ditches, digging holes, wells, trying to find something all around the Nile. But guess what? They couldn't even drink that water. 
pretty incredible how God's hand just stretched all over. So we see here, as um, we go in very quickly, I've got a couple minutes, as we go in very quickly and go through chapter 8, few verses. And the Lord spoke to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say to him, thus says the Lord, let my people go that they may serve me. Uh, But if you refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all your territory with frogs, with frogs. Um, So the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly. That means a lot of frogs, which shall go up and come into your house, into your bedroom, on your bed, into the houses of your servants, on your people, into your ovens, into your kneading bowls. And the frog shall come up on you, on your people, and on all your servants. Wow. Lots of frogs, folks. Can you imagine that? Lots of frogs being brought up out of the river. It happened. It's going to happen. This plague, like I said, is so deliberate. God is so cool. It's deliberate because the Egyptians worshipped the frog god. The frog god was the body of a woman and the frog head of a frog. The head of a frog, all right? Head of a frog, body of a woman. And this was, um, now, now, that's funny. I had a joke, but, you know, I would say, gee, that's a worst case scenario for a blind date, isn't it? That's <laughs> terrible. Okay, this person, this goddess that they worshiped, body of a woman, head of a frog, this goddess that they worshiped, little G, uh, was associated with fertility and also thought to assist women in childbirth. So go figure. That's what they thought. So we see here that God is very specific in attacking their gods. The Nile, now the frogs. Going on in verse 5. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Say to Aaron, stretch out your hand with your rod over the streams, over the rivers, over the ponds, and cause the frogs to come up out of the land of Egypt. So Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. Absolutely they did. And the magicians did so with their enchantments and brought them and brought up frogs on the land of Egypt. Man, you stop there at verse 7. How kooky is that? Not only did the Lord produce abundant frogs, right? So much so, and you read in verse 3 where they're going to be, 3 and 4, all over the place. But the, but the magicians couldn't do anything else except bring up more frogs. They couldn't kill the frogs, right? Bet they tried. They couldn't kill them. All they could do was bring up more frogs. It just doesn't make sense to me why they would do that. But that's just kind of weird, huh, that they would be doing that. That's kind of goofy. So we go on further in Scripture. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in verse 8 and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and my people, and I will let the people go that they may sacrifice to the Lord. And Moses said to Pharaoh, Accept the honor of the saying when I shall intercede for you, for your servants and for your people to destroy the frogs in your houses that they may remain in the river only. So he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Let it be according to your word that you may know that there is no one like the Lord our God. Talk about even more kookiness. Pharaoh, he's got all these frogs around him. His magicians made more frogs coming out. And then he goes, well, because, you know, Moses is going, so tell me, when do you want me to get rid of the frogs? And Pharaoh goes, uh, tomorrow. Why not today? Why not right now? I would have done that, but I'm not Pharaoh. So he decides to wait one more day to have all the frogs gone. Again, that's a weird thing to do. It's kind of goofy, but he did that. So we pick up now. Verse 11. And the frogs shall depart from you, from your houses, from your servants, and from your people. They they shall remain in the river only. Then Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. And Moses cried out to the Lord concerning the frogs, which he had brought against Pharaoh. So the Lord did according to the word of Moses. And the frogs died out of the houses out of the courtyards and out of the fields. They gathered them together in the heaps and the land stinketh, right? But when Pharaoh saw that there was relief, here we go, he hardened his heart and he did not heed them as the Lord had said. We're going to stop there right now due to a lack of time. But you know what? We see what's happening. We see what's going on now within the heart of Pharaoh. And remember this. Pharaoh is totally making the choice himself to harden his heart. And so we're going to see this 
theme all the way through up and through the end of chapter 13 where Pharaoh says, enough is enough. Your people can go get out of here. So with that, let's close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, God, that as we see that everything is so specific and for a purpose, God. God, we know that you wanted your children out, but we know, God, more important to you was your redemptive your redemption, Lord, given through and by your people to the world, God. That was the, the main thing. God, we also see that just by um, you showing these different plagues, these miracle plagues, God, that you indeed had specific reasons and purposes for those, Lord, to attack their gods, to put them down, Lord God. And so, Lord, they couldn't do anything. And so, God, may we know and go away encouraged tonight, Lord, that you do and you are a God of miracles, Lord. No matter what the situation, no matter what the circumstance, but God, you are a miracle worker and you work miracles in our lives. So, Lord, tonight, may we not be enchanted or taken by the things of the world, Lord, those things in Egypt, God, those false idols. Lord, may we always worship the one true and living God, the God Jehovah, Yahweh. So, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We praise your holy name. And it's in your son's precious name that we all say, amen, amen. God bless you guys. God bless you. Don't forget this uh, Sunday we are here here in this place, 1030. May you guys go and grow in His grace. You are dismissed this coming Sunday.